The media and the mechanisms for distributing information today are tools, and like most tools, if placed in the wrong hands, they can be used as weapons. One of these weapons is propaganda, so we should take a close look at how powerful it can be and how hard it is at times to detect with an untrained eye. In 1928, a man named Edward Bernays, who was considered to be the father of public relations, published a book revealing his ingenious methods for shaping public opinion using the available media at the time newspapers, magazines, black and white films, and radio. Television was something that was just being experimented with and wouldn't become a major medium until over 20 years later in the 1950s. Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud, the famous psychologist, which may explain how he himself became such an expert in psychology. His knowledge of how to influence large numbers of people using the media was so far ahead of its time that still today, almost 100 years later, Bernays' methods are used as the standard operating procedure for advertisers, activists, and governments. Governments. The American Tobacco Company, the manufacturer of the Lucky Strike brand, hired him in 1929 to help promote cigarettes, and as a result of his marketing campaign, he is largely credited with making smoking seem cool. What he did was hire a group of beautiful women to light up cigarettes while they were marching in New York City's Easter Sunday parade, since women smoking at the time was taboo. He then sent out a press release claiming they lit up, quote, torches of freedom to support women's rights. The New York Times published an article the next day with the headline, quote, group of girls puff cigarettes as gesture of freedom. He had created a self-fulfilling prophecy by duping newspapers into portraying smoking women as part of the growing women's rights movement, when in reality, it was just a marketing ploy by a tobacco company. Bernays is also the man responsible for the tradition of men buying women diamonds as a symbol of love and marriage. As you know, at least in the United States, the tradition of proposing marriage to a woman must be done with a diamond ring. And every Christmas, Valentine's Day, and Mother's Day, we are bombarded by average advertisements about buying diamonds for the women in our lives. This cultural norm, however, was artificially created by Edward Bernays after the De Beers Diamond Company, in reality a monopoly, hired him to promote diamonds as the standard symbol of love. Before Bernays' scheme was launched, engagement and wedding rings were just a gold band. But using his techniques of social conditioning, he was able to brainwash men and women into believing that a large diamond ring was needed in order to propose marriage or to show a woman that a man loves her. When we look into Bernays' methods, it becomes stunningly clear just how powerful they are and how candid he was about this power in his book. He wrote, quote, those who manipulate the unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of. In almost every act of our lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by a relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires that control the public mind, who harness social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. He also admitted, quote, whatever of social importance is done today, whether in politics, finance, manufacture, agriculture, charity, education, or other fields, must be done with the help of propaganda. Propaganda is the executive arm of the invisible government. This invisible government, he says, tends to be concentrated in the hands of the few because of the expense of manipulating the social machinery which controls the opinions and habits of the masses. The expensive machinery he was referring to are the printing presses and film studios, as well as the large costs associated with producing and distributing newspapers and radio broadcasts at the time, which was so expensive that only a handful of companies could afford to be in those businesses. It wasn't until fairly recently with the creation of computers, the internet, smartphones, and social media that this monopoly has changed. Although the multi-billion dollar mainstream media conglomerates still have enormous influence and control over the creation of content and its distribution and are constantly trying to adapt and hold on to what was once an ironclad grip on the industry. As Ben Bagdikian, the former dean of the University of California Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism points out in his book, The New Media Monopoly, quote, the possibilities for mutual promotion among all their various media is the basic reason the Big Five, now actually the Big Six, Comcast, News Corporation, Time Warner, Disney, Viacom, and CBS, 
have become major owners of all kinds of media. For example, actors and actresses in a conglomerate's wholly owned movie studio can appear on the same company's television and cable networks. Photographs of newly minted celebrities can dominate the covers of the firm's wholly owned magazines. And those celebrities can be interviewed on the firm's wholly owned radio and television talk shows. The conglomerate can commission an author from its wholly owned book publishing firm to write a biography or a purported autobiography of the new stars, which in turn is promoted on the firm's other media, end quote. He continues saying that the major media socialize every generation of Americans, whether the viewers and listeners are conscious of it or not. They're being, quote, educated in role models, in social behavior, in their early assumptions about the world into which they will venture, and in what to assume about their unseen millions of fellow citizens. George Orwell warned of this same propaganda power in his classic novel 1984 when he said, Said, quote, all the beliefs, habits, tastes, emotions, mental attitudes that characterize our time are really designed to sustain the mystique of the party and prevent the true nature of present day society from being perceived. The technical term for what they're doing is called agenda setting. They magnify selected stories and topics through their constant coverage and endless panel discussions about every little detail. Talking for hours on end about the stories creates a self-fulfilling prophecy by building certain instances into major issues and by treating them as if they are major issues when they're not and getting people to talk about them and think about them so much then they become major issues. As television became part of everyone's lives, a study was conducted during the 1968 presidential election called the Chapel Hill Study, which showed a strong correlation between what people thought were the most important election issues and what the national news media repeatedly reported were the most important issues. It basically showed that instead of just reporting on the news, the networks were actually influencing what people thought was news. For example, the liberal media takes people like Michael Brown and Trayvon Martin and turns them into celebrities from the non-stop glowing coverage. Their names even trend on Twitter on their birthdays and the anniversaries of their deaths and the dumbed down general public view them as martyrs and civil rights icons as a result of the brainwash. In reality, virtually every single black man shot and killed by police are armed and dangerous thugs with long criminal histories, but those facts are ignored and the incidents are always framed as another innocent black man who was murdered by police because of racism. There's so much more you should know, so order my book, The True Story of Fake News, or The Liberal Media Industrial Complex, or my newest one, Hollywood Propaganda, How TV, Movies, and Music Shape Our Culture, in paperback from Amazon.com, or download the ebooks onto your tablet from any of the major ebook stores. And of course, there's a link to the Amazon listings in the description below. So click it and head on over there and check them out.